Japanese tales. Take it in. A newly appointed viceroy of Kyushu had many children, but the last of them was his favorite, a bright and handsome son, now twenty years old. Though not from a warlike family, the young man was remarkably strong and brave, and his parents were so fond of him that they took him down to Kyushu with them. Meanwhile, the deputy viceroy's assistant, the governor of Chikuzin, had a lovely teenage daughter whom he and his wife loved so much that they had taken her down to Kyushu too. The deputy viceroy was so eager for the two to marry that his assistant could hardly refuse, and on an auspicious day the pair were happily united. But the groom had always aspired to government career, and he now planned to go up to the capital. Parting from his wife was out of the question, and so he decided to take her with him, by land, since the sea route seemed a bit risky. He set off with a party of twenty picked retainers, and with a train of pack horses and of servants on foot. They were making good time when they reached Inimo no Harim late on a January afternoon. A stiff wind was blowing, mixed with snow. From the mountains to the north a monk rode toward them, an imposing fellow in a red robe, violent trousers, and straw boots, carrying a lacquered whip. The saddle on his spirited horse was inlaid with mother of pearl. He dismounted and bowed respectfully to the young man. I have long served his excellency, the governor of Chikuzen, he said. I happen to hear, sir, that you are on your way to the capital, and since I live in the mountains north of here, I came to offer my hospitality, if you do not mind roughing it a bit. He was ever so polite. The young man's retainers all dismounted and turned while the young man reined in his horse. Oh, it is very kind of you, he replied, but I want to get to Kyoto as fast as I can. I may return to Kyosho next year, though, and I will be happy to visit you then. But the monk would simply not take no for an answer. The sun had almost sunk behind the mountains by now, and the retainers were so obviously eager to accept that at last the young man finally yielded. The monk led the way with a satisfied air, assuring his guests that they had not far to go. Two or three miles brought them to a compound entirely surrounded by a singular high wall. The monk took the young couple straight in to what appeared to be living quarters on the south side of the compound, and had refreshments served them while the horses were foddered. The servants and retainers, meanwhile, were given lodgings a good way off. After a lively and luxurious feast, the couple, alone but for a maid or two, loosened their clothes and lay down. The maids had enjoyed themselves freely and were now asleep, but the couple were wide awake, somehow ill at ease. They had hardly eaten or drunk any food, and as they chattered, they assured each other tenderly of their love, and wondered, in a strangely gloomy mood, what their journey would yet bring them. Slowly the hours passed. In the small hours they heard with misgiving footsteps approaching from the house. Suddenly the door by the head of their bed slid open, and the young man jumped up but was seized by the hair and dragged away. Strong though he was, it had all happened simply too fast. He had not been evil to pick up the sword he had kept by his pillow. The assailant knocked a shutter open and hauled him out of the room. Kanimaru, he called, are you ready? See that you take care of the usual. Right, answered a nasty voice. Hans seized the young man's collar and hustled him off. There was a fenced area in one corner of the compound, and the gate in the fence opened to a pit thirty feet deep, with hundreds of sharpened bamboo stakes planted at the bottom. Year after year, travelers like the young man, on their way back and forth to the capital, were lured in, given wine that left them dead drunk, then thrown into the pit while their similarly drunk retainers were stripped of everything they owned. Some retainers were killed, while others, the more promising ones, were pressed into service. This was the trap the young man and his party had fallen into. Kanimaru dragged the young man to the fence, opened the gate, and propelled him through it. But the young man clung to a gatepost and could not be budged further. Kanimaru got on the pit side of him and pulled. There was a slight in-kind down from the gate, and the young man shifted his weight and gave a powerful shove, which sent Kanimaru hurling into the pit. Then he closed the gate and stole under the veranda of the house. At last he was able to think. He could try to arouse his retainers, but they were unconscious with drink, and besides there was a moat between him and them, and the bridge was drawn. 
Instead, he crept under the floor of the room where he had just been. He heard the monk come in to his wife. No doubt you'll be shocked to hear me confess it, said the monk. But in the daylight, when the wind blew your veil aside, I caught a glimpse of your face. And now I can think only of you. Forgive me, he slid into bed beside her. Before I started up to the capital, I made a vow to abstain for one hundred days, the wife replied. There are just three days left. When those three days are over, I will do anything you say. What I have in mind will bring you far more merit than that. The man who is everything to me has vanished before my eyes, and I can't prevent you doing whatever you want with me. I can't refuse you in the end, you know that. You've no need to be so impatient, she was holding him off. Conceding she had a point, the monk finally went away. The husband of mine would not die so shameful a death, the woman murmured to herself, and the young man under the floor, raging, heard her. He pushed a sliver of wood up through a crack between the floorboards, right in front of her, and when she saw it, she knew she'd been right. She waggled the, silver, the sliver, and he knew she had understood. The monk kept coming back to try again, but she always managed to put him off. When he was finally gone, the wife silently opened a shutter, and her husband came out from under the floor into the room. Both burst into tears and promised each other that if they were to die, they should die together. The young man asked what had happened to his sword. I hid it under the matting when you were dragged away, she answered, and brought it out. It was a ray of hope at last. Sword in hand, the young man stealthily made his way toward his retainers. Seven or eight carving blocks stood beside a long fire pit, and the monk's men were sprawled nearby amid the scattered remains of their dinner, their bows, quivers, armor, daggers, and swords beside them. The monk himself was asleep on his armrest. A pair of tables before him bore silver vessels, full of the leavings from his meal. "'Help me now, O canon of Hasarada, the young man prayed. "'Let me see my parents again.' Since the monk was so unexpectedly sleeping, he decided to attack straight off, and cut off the monk's head, for he saw no chance of escape. At the first blow, the monk cried out and raised his arms in fright, but the next blow killed him. The monk's men were certainly many, but Cannon must really have protected the young man, because when they saw their leader dead, they thought they had been invaded by a large force. Besides, they themselves had all been caught and forced into service by the man, and they had no wish to fight for him. Now he was dead. It did not occur to any of them to resist. Instead, they all blurted at once, I, do in I didn't do anything wrong. I used to serve this lord so-and-so before I fell into this trap. And the young man put on a good show of having ample reinforcements behind him, herded them all off, and locked them all up. It was a long wait till dawn. When day came at last, he aroused his own retainers, who came out dazed and rubbing their eyes to clear away the fumes of last night's wine. They sobered up right away when they heard what had happened and went to look at the pit. The bamboo stakes down at the bottom bristled up through corpses both new and old. Konamaru, a lanky youth, cad in a single miserable wrap and with the clog still on his feet, lay there impaled, still twitching. The scene might as well have been from hell. Now the young man called the monk's servants out again, and they confessed all the terrible things that had been made to do over the years. They were not punished, then say themselves were not responsible. A messenger was sent with a report for the emperor, who was greatly impressed with the young man's deed. Finally, the young man himself went up to Kyoto, received an official post, and found that everything went for him just as he had always hoped. He and his wife stayed there with each other through all the trials and joys that came their way, and must often have talked over their memories of that awful night. No one ever discovered any relative of other connection of the robber monk, as for him, the matter was closed. It took a wise and prudent man to do what the young man did. Anyone who hears this story should consider himself warned not to spend the night in a place he doesn't know. Note, too, that the young man could have done nothing without Cannon's help. Not that Cannon ever wishes to kill, but after all, the robber had killed many people himself, and Cannon could hardly approve.